at the end of the last lecture, I tried to motivate why uh, in a realistic material context, we have to deal with dynamically screened interactions. So today I would like to uh, explain how we can do dynamical mean field simulations for models with dynamically uh, screened interactions. And uh, in the next lecture, we will then uh, introduce some extension of the dynamical mean field formalism, which also requires us to solve uh, problems with dynamically screened interactions. So, So let us consider a Hubbard model, which has a dynamically screened interaction. So this is our model, like this model. hopping T, and the interaction is frequency dependent. So in a Hamiltonian formulation, this means uh, we have a coupling to bosonic modes with characteristic frequency omega, and this uh, produces this frequency dependence in a action formulation. It just means we have a retarded uh, Coulomb interaction. So. Uh, if we map this now to the impurity problem in the, in the action formulation, we just have an impurity system which has a retarded on-site interaction. one correlated site in a non-interacting bath, which is represented by this hybridization function. And the interaction is now itself uh, retarded. So it's a retarded interaction U of tau. Uh, U of tau is just the Fourier transform of U of omega. So the Impurity action now has the following form. We have the usual hybridization term. chemical potential term. And then we have a retarded interaction, which is of the following form. Screening does not distinguish between uh, uh, spins, so the long-range interaction, uh, the, the, the retarded Coulomb interaction also acts between the same spins. So we can write we can write the interaction term in this uh, form, where the total density is just n up 
plots and down. And as I sketched uh, yesterday, the typical interaction in the frequency space looks something like this. At high frequency, we have a high value, u bar. And then at some frequency uh, called the plasmon uh, frequency, there is a strong reduction of the interaction to some screened value u screened. So this is the real part of u of omega. And so we can <coughs> separate this into a sort of static or frequency independent contribution u bare and a sort of screening contribution, which is the, the rest. So we can write u of omega is u bare plus u tilde of omega, and this u tilde of omega now goes to zero at high frequencies. So we basically shift everything down here by uh, u bar and define this function u tilde, which looks something like this, and this would be the real part of u tilde of omega, and this one goes to zero at high frequencies. And the static value of uh, u tilde would then be u screened minus u bare. So u that's just a, a shift. And then if we go to the time domain, we will find that this constant value and frequency will give us a delta function contribution in time, so an instantaneous uh, repulsive interaction corresponding to the bear value, and this will give us a retarded attractive uh, contribution which now describes the screening effect. So u of tau is then of the following form, u bear delta tau, plus u tilde of tau, where this is sort of the repulsive pair Coulomb interaction and this is a attractive retarded interaction which comes from the screening. So then the interaction we have to treat as the following form in the time domain. So it's a, a beta periodic function. Here is zero minus beta plus beta. So this is the time axis. So we have a delta function contribution uh, with strength u bare. this one, and then we have an attractive 
without a contribution like this, which is u tilde of tau. And that is this contribution. And that should be compared to a simulation where we just take the screen static value. Very often, up to now, people have just said, okay, maybe these are very high energies. We, we don't care what happens at these high energies. We just take the static value here, and then the description would be one uh, which has the following interaction. It just has a delta function like interaction with the reduce uh, screened interaction like this. Yeah. So that would be the conventional sort of static description in terms of the screen interaction. But now we want to treat the full problem where we have a very strong uh, instantaneous repulsion from the high frequency uh, component or high frequency limit and then a reduction of this uh, interaction from an attractive retarded uh, component which describes the screening effect of the of the environment. Okay. And so in the following, we will also use a spectral uh, representation of this retarded interaction. So this is kind of photonic function. It is eta periodic. So we can write it as follows. write u tilde of tau in terms of the imaginary part of the frequency dependent u as minus 1 over pi minus infinity to infinity d omega and then imaginary part of u tilde of omega and that's the spectral density and then this bosonic uh, kernel e to the minus omega tau uh, e to the minus theta omega plus one, uh, minus one, sorry. So then we can also use the symmetry of uh, imaginary part of u to uh, split this integral into uh, two parts, and then we can combine these two and just write integral from zero to infinity the omega imaginary part u tilde of omega and then uh, cosine hyperbolic uh, omega times theta half minus tau divided by sine hyperbolic beta omega theta half. So that's the relation between the imaginary part of u of omega and u of tau. And we will use this expression uh, in the following. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, there, there is uh, initial part with the frequency dependent uh, part that is higher than this. Ah, uh, here? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, you are wondering what is this? Yeah, uh, I mean, yes, for a very small initial part, uh, yeah. you say it's uh, greater than zero, right? Yeah, so if you would, if you would study a Holstein model where you just have one bosonic uh, mode coupling to the electrons, your frequency dependent interaction would uh, look as follows. You would have a, basically a, a pole at the boson frequency. And then, if this is your u bear, you would have basically a pole structure like this. So that would be the 
that would be the effective retarded interaction or frequency dependent interaction from a boson with energy omega zero coupling to your electrons. And so now in reality you have sort of a continuum of bosonic modes in a certain energy range and then it smears out this pole and you, you get sort of a smeared out version of, of, of this uh, pole structure. It doesn't matter how. Uh, no, no. I mean, the, 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 this function can be anything. Yeah. Yeah. Just an input of the calculation. You put in this in a basically tabulated form and, and use it. So now um, I would like to explain how we can easily extend this uh, algorithm, Monte Carlo algorithm, which I introduced yesterday to these types of retarded interactions. And so I showed you these segment configurations. And the only thing we now have to understand is how we can compute the interaction contribution for, for this type of uh, frequency dependent or retarded interaction. So let me write the interaction term once again. It was this term with the total density and the retarded U. So this we now have to evaluate for some given uh, segment configuration where the total density is an up plus and down. And the uh, retarded U has these two contributions, the bare one with the delta function and the retarded one, like this. All right, and now we just uh, plug this in and evaluate this formula. We get the following from this delta function. We get the term with the bare interaction. Like this. We also have <coughs> contributions and up squared and then down squared. And then we use the fermionic property that n squared is n. And again, the delta function then gives us a second contribution u bare half integral d tau n up plus n down. So basically these are the contributions from n up squared and then down squared. And then we have the contribution from the retarded part, which uh, looks as follows. We have the contributions from opposite, opposite spins. And we have contributions from the same spins. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, sorry. So let's draw our segment configuration. So this is the time interval. We have up and down. And suppose we have some segment here and here. So, okay, this term corresponds to this overlap contribution which we introduced last time with the bare interaction, okay? So this is this u, u bare times the length of the overlap. That's this first term here. This term here is basically a shift of the chemical potential by u bare half. So this is like a chemical potential contribution, and this we can absorb into a shift of mu. That takes care of this term. And now we have a retarded interaction between up and down electrons. So that would be something like this. So we have, say, tau 1 here interacts with some tau 2 here. So that would be this term. And finally, we also have sort of intra-segment interactions of electrons in the same segment like this. So that's this contribution. Okay. And so this one would be, for example, n up, tau 1, u tilde, tau 1 minus tau 2, and down tau 2. And now we have to integrate over all times uh, in these segments. Yeah. So, so let us uh, split up this contribution into the contribution of, of all pairs of segments for all sort of intra-segment contributions for each uh, segment. So to write this in a general way, we now in, introduce a name for each segment. We call it, say, the segment number i is denoted by Ki. Then we can, for this uh, intersegment contribution, we can just sum over all pairs of segments in our configurations. So this is the sum of all k1 
different from K2. And then the integral over segment K1, the integral over segment K2, and then this retarded interaction. And then we have the kind of intra-segment contribution where the both integrals run over the same segment. And that is one half sum over all segments, k, and then the integral of both times over the same segment. Like this. So this would be what we call the kind of inter segment contribution. That would be the red red guy here. And the blue would be the intra-segment contribution. And now we have to evaluate these double integrals. And that is easy if we know the twice integrated function u tilde. Then we can easily evaluate the double integral. So let's assume for the moment that we know it and that it has specific symmetries which we can assure by, by properly choosing the integration constants if we do this double integral. So, so let us assume that a function h of tau is a bosonic function symmetric around beta half which satisfies that the second derivative is the retarded interaction. So this basically means that we want a function which has the same, same properties as the retarded interaction. It's beta periodic and symmetric. And the second derivative should be our retarded interaction. And then we can easily express these double integrals in terms of this function. For example, um, example, let's do this double integral here. So I define the start and end point of segment number one and the start and end point of segment number two. And so we want to evaluate this double integral. And with the help of our function h, we can express this as follows, as minus h of tau 1n minus tau 2n uh, plus h tau 1n minus tau 2 start plus h tau 2 tau 1 start minus tau 
to n minus h tau uh, one start minus tau two start. Yeah, so that's very elementary. And if we, ah, so if we draw again our segment configuration, the one which I just erased, we now see that this contribution can be sort of considered as an interaction between the endpoints of these segments, for example. So this would be tau one start, tau one end, tau two start, tau two end. So we have an interaction tau one end minus tau two end. That's something like this. And then tau one end minus tau to start, that's something like this. Then we have also these kind of interactions. Yeah? So this would be minus h of tau one n minus tau two n. So these are the inter-segment contributions. Now let's look at the intra-segment contribution. This we can also evaluate in a similar manner. So tau, just from tau start to tau end. And then the same tau start, tau end. that we can then write as follows as minus two h of zero plus h of tau n minus tau start plus h of tau start minus tau n. And if we use the symmetry property of this function, we can write this as two times h of tau n minus tau start, because h is even. And so then we obtain the following. We obtain h of tau n minus tau start minus 1 half h of 0 minus one half h of zero. And this we can graphically represent as follows. This is tau n minus tau start. And then we also have sort of a loop here, which is minus one half h zero. And similarly, for this segment, we would have an interaction line like this and a loop. So that's the evaluation of these double integrals. Then if we combine the contributions, basically these lines from all segments, we get uh, 
the following uh, interaction energy from the retarded interaction. As follows, minus n times h of zero, minus, and now sum, over all pairs of operators, i not bigger than j, s i, s j, h, tau i, minus tau j, where this s is a sign factor, s i, is plus one if the operator at position i is a creation operator and it's minus one if it's an annihilation operator. For example, example here, I probably just made a mistake because, um, oh, no, no, it's okay. Yeah, for example here, you see um, that this line connects a creation operator and an annihilation operator, and has, it has the opposite sign from this line, which connects an annihilation operator to an annihilation operator. So depending on what type of operators we connect by these lines, we have a different uh, sign here. So that's the interaction contribution, and we can rewrite it a little bit if we want, as follows, as minus sum of all pairs, and these sign factors, and then h of tau i minus tau j minus h of zero, and you can check that basically because of cancellation effects from these signs, only each, each segment contributes in the end one uh, factor h of zero, and that gives them n times h of zero in the end. Good, so now we have sort of our weight contribution from the retarded interaction. We just have to figure out now what is H for some, for some retarded interaction. And so we have H, the second derivative of H is the retarded interaction U tilde. And this we can repre represent or, or write in the spectral representation as this integral of over omega from zero to infinity of the imaginary part of u tilde of omega and then this cosine hyperbolic function uh, omega times tau minus beta half divided by a uh, sine hyperbolic omega beta half. 
And now we just have to basically integrate this function twice. And since it's written here in a, as a kind of uh, in Fourier space, it just means uh, divide twice by the frequency. So each integral gives a division by omega. So we basically have to now divide here by omega squared. And that gives us the final formula. which is that h of tau minus h of zero, which appears here in this weight, is one over pi integral from zero to infinity, d omega, then imaginary part of u of omega divided by omega squared. And then the difference between two cosine hyperbolic functions Like this. So that's the explicit form of this uh, function. And this we can, in principle, just read in and tabulate in our program. And then this determines these uh, contributions uh, to our weight, which is then easily evaluated. So in the end, we can basically treat arbitrary frequency-dependent interactions at the almost the same computational cost as static interactions because evaluating these lines is very cheap compared to, for example, manipulating the determinants uh, of the hybridization matrices. So it's basically for free we can treat uh, these retardation effects. So here I should say that this uh, formula is valid for tau between zero and beta. And then it is an even function uh, of beta, and the beta periodic and even function. And so this brings us to one slight um, subtlety which we still have to <coughs> properly take into account. Namely this uh, function h minus h of zero has a slope discontinuity at zero because of this uh, symmetry. which looks like this. And so so the formula H double prime is U is only valid sort of between zero and beta, but not at this point. At this point, uh, the first derivative has a discontinuity and the second derivative will give us a delta function because of this uh, 
symmetry. So at this point, uh, this relation is violated, and now we have to correct for this violation of this uh, relation. So basically now the first derivative of H at this point has a jump. And the second derivative has a delta function at tau equals zero, uh, whose weight we can compute from here. The weight of this delta function is basically two times the, the first derivative at zero. So two times h prime at zero plus. That's the weight of the delta function. And so let's calculate two times h prime of zero plus from this formula. That will give us two times one over pi an integral from zero to infinity, d omega, imaginary part of u tilde, omega, over omega times minus one. So that's the, the weight of this delta function. And now if you look at this formula, maybe you it reminds you of the Kramers-Kronig uh, formula, which relates the real and imaginary parts of a complex function. So uh, then you can uh, recognize that this is nothing else than the real part of u tilde at omega equals zero. So the static part of u tilde, that's basically by using the kramers konig uh, formula. So what this means is that if we use this H function, we have to subtract a delta function contribution uh, with weight real part of the static uh, value of U tilde. And so what was uh, this static limit of u tilde? So if we rem remember the picture, so we had this uh, this shift by u bare. So the static value is u screened minus u bare. So that is minus u screened minus.
and it's you there, the delta of tau. So the total instantaneous interaction therefore becomes the following. So previously we have the, just the u bear term, but now we have u bear plus this u tilde, uh, this real part of u tilde at omega equals zero. And that, if we use this relationship, just gives us u screened times delta tau. So Basically what this does, if we properly take into account this slope discontinuity contribution, it just means that if we calculate the overlap here, we have to calculate it with the screened interaction rather than with the bare one. And that takes care of this. So this now becomes, this now becomes u screened times the length of the overlap. Okay. Then we are basically done. And we know how to calculate the local interaction of a given segment configuration. then we have the overlap contribution now with the screened interaction instead of the bare one. Then we have the shifted chemical potential also actually with the screened interaction times the length of the segments. And then from the retarded part of the interaction, we have this sum over all operator pairs, the sign assigned to each operator, whether it's a creation or an annihilation operator, and then this h function, h of tau i minus tau j minus h of zero, where we have uh, the explicit expression for this h function basically the imaginary part of u divided by omega squared times this cosine hyperbolic function. So the Monte Carlo sampling proceeds in exactly the same way as before, except that we replace the bare interaction by the screened one, shift the chemical potential, and we have to add these sort of 
non-local interaction lines between all pairs of operators, which we can explicitly evaluate with this formula, and which is quite uh, cheap. Okay, so meaning if we, if we insert a new segment here, like this, then basically whatever operators are around, we have to sort of compute all possible uh, non-local interactions with these new operators like this. But that's, uh, as I said, is uh, actually cheap, a cheap thing to do, and it's not really a slowing down the simulation in uh, any significant way. So that's all I wanted to say about the algorithm. So if you have questions about the algorithm, you should maybe ask it now. How it would look like, yeah, yes. So if you want to represent this in a Hamiltonian form, um, it would look it would look like like 
as follows. So the local part of the Hamiltonian would be u times n up and down minus mu n up plus n down. And then you would have a coupling to to an infinite uh, set of bosonic uh, nodes of the type, uh, say, g lambda n, say, n up plus n down, times g dagger lambda plus g lambda plus some lambda, omega lambda. So this is an oscillator with frequency omega lambda, and then you couple the electrons to these uh, bosons via this type of coupling. And basically the G lambda would be related to the imaginary part of, of U. So this is more or less your imaginary part of U at the frequency omega lambda. Because now if you, if you have such an electron boson system and you integrate out the bosons, you will precisely get this kind of retarded or frequency dependent uh, interaction. But it's relatively complicated to think about it in terms of uh, Hamiltonian, so it's much nicer to work with the action where all these bosons are integrated out and you just have a retarded interaction in the imaginary time. But physically, this is really where it comes from. I mean, yesterday I sketched a little bit this constrained random phase approximation where you do the downfolding. And these bosons, more or less, these are the particle hole excitations of electrons into higher bands, which produce you this sort of bosonic uh, modes which couple with a specific uh, coupling strength and have an associated energy which is related to the, the, the separation between the bands. So basically if you have, this is your low energy theory which you are interested in, now you have some high energy band, you do this kind of a transition that will produce you some bosonic excitation with an energy, say, omega lambda, like this. And that produces you a screening of the Coulomb interaction at this particular energy. Ah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's sort of this uh, separation into low energy and high energy screening modes, which I discussed yesterday. So in principle, both, right? So for the fully screened interaction, you would have uh, also the, the low energy excitations within the band like this. But in the if you want to compute the Hubbard U for this low energy theory, you should actually exclude these processes. Otherwise, you double count these processes because in the solution of the impurity problem, you explicitly treat this kind of uh, screening contributions. 
But if you compute the fully screened interaction, you also have to add these. Okay, so then um, So then I would like to move on to the next topic, which is uh, how to define a dynamical mean field formalism for problems with long range Coulomb interactions. Yes. Shall yeah. Or so you want to stop now? I mean. Yeah, so maybe I can more or less get started and then we. Yeah, mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes, so the, so the next topic is trying to devise a dynamical mean field formalism for models with long range interactions. And you, as we will see, is that this also leads to a formalism with dynamically screened interactions. And the formalism is called extended DMFT. and has been developed actually in various different uh, contexts for spin systems for, for various types of uh, systems by, by different groups. And this is a, a DMFT formalism for models with spatially non-local long-ranged interactions. As an example, we will discuss the so-called U V Hubbard model. U is the on-site interaction, V is whatever inter-site interaction. So the Hamiltonian is the following. We have the usual kinetic term. The usual chemical potential term. And then the on-site interaction as in the Hubbard model And now also an uh, interaction between different sites. Where this N here is the total charge. Ni is N I up plus N I down. And these angular brackets, we uh, denote the nearest neighbor pair. So we take here, just as an example, the nearest neighbor interactions. But it can, in principle, be anything.
So the new term is this uh, non-local Coulomb interaction. And so it will be interesting to see how we can treat such a term in a, in a DMFT approximation, which is based on a, on a local impurity problem. So the first step is to rewrite this in an action formulation. We will uh, work with the action, that's easier. And first, let's write the action for the lattice, just this lattice model. So we use a uh, Rossmann variables, and then the action can be written as follows integral over the imaginary time of, well, some kinetic term the kinetic term written uh, in the action formalism and then the interaction term plus CU sum over I and I up of tau and I down and the interaction which we can gen write as a general VIJ and n i is tau n j of tau. And now for this specific uh, model with nearest neighbor hopping and nearest neighbor interaction, we would have that t i j is minus t times delta i j, so only nearest neighbor hopping, and this v i j would be um, v times delta i j. So interaction V only between nearest neighbor sites, but in principle it can be anything, it doesn't matter. Now the first thing is to slightly rewrite the interaction term. So we write this term here as follows, as U half sum over all sides, and then an E up plus an E down squared minus U half sum over I, an E up plus an E down. So that is again using this property that N squared is N for fermions. We can rewrite the interaction term like this. And so this becomes, again, a shift of the chemical potential. And here we have the total N. So this is Ni squared. And so, so we can now combine it with this long-range part, which is also written in terms of the total density on a given site. So that's the, the reason why we rewrite it like this. Then we find the following expression.
can call mu tilde if we want this shift of chemical potential. And here I have now uh, written a V tilde, and this V tilde in our case of the nearest neighbor interaction and nearest neighbor hopping is just uh, U times delta IJ, that's the on site interaction, plus V times delta for nearest neighbor interactions. Okay. And so if we are on a square lattice, we can write down the Fourier transforms of the hopping and this uh, infraction matrix easily. We only have nearest neighbor hoppings. The Fourier transform of the hopping matrix gives us an epsilon of k, which is minus 2t cos kx plus cos ky. And similarly, if we only have nearest neighbor interactions, we can Fourier transform this v i j tilde, and this gives us a v tilde of k, which is u from the on-site interaction, and then plus 2v, also the same cosine plus cos ky. Okay, and now uh, the interesting uh, part starts, and maybe we will then really go through this in detail after uh, the break, but now uh, we want to map this to a single site problem, and in order to do this, we have to first decouple somehow the long-range interactions, and that we do by uh, hubbard stratonovich uh, transformations, and this transformation now replaces the inter-site coupling by the local coupling to the hubbard stratonovich field. And then if we have only local couplings, we can sort of map the problem to a single site effective model, which has also a, a coupling to such a hubbard stratonovich field. And, and then we are back to a single site uh, description with, with coupling to a hubbard stratonovich field. And that is more or less a bosonic field. And then we have a a dynamically screened interaction where the screening now comes from this uh, uh, hubbard stratonovich field. And that's more or less the, the extended DMFT formalism. And I think we probably make a break now. And then after the break, I will explain in detail how this, how this decoupling works. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you.